All right. It looks like as we've got folks logging on and connecting to audio, I just want to say uh, hello and welcome to everybody to our scholar session tonight. Uh, my name is Hannah. I'm the Director of Advancement with President Lincoln's Cottage, and we're so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. Um, particularly happy to have our team member Lincolns with us, uh, whose annual gifts help preserve the cottage and make programs like this and many others possible. Um, in addition to supporting our mission, our team Lincoln members receive discounted tickets, um, special invites, and complimentary access to some of our programming, um, and discounts at our museum store, and more. If you're not already a member, or if you realize that you need to renew, uh, you can do so online at lincolncottage.org slash membership. Um, I won't delay us any further, um, and I'll pass it along to our executive director and CEO, Dr. Michael Atwood Mason. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate that welcome um, and also say thank you to the board members who have joined us this evening. It's always exciting to have our volunteer leaders in, in, engage with us on programs. Um, we're really excited tonight to bring you a conversation with David J. Kent. Um, David was trained as a marine biologist and, and worked for years in the world of science um, as a consultant and as an environmental toxicologist. Um, he, after an award-winning career in science, he um, decided to switch gears uh, and, and bring his deep, long-standing passion for Abraham Lincoln to the fore. And he's been uh, a very productive Lincoln scholar. Uh, he has two other books, Lincoln, The Man Who Saved America, and Abraham Lincoln and Nikola Tesla, Connected by Fate. And tonight, we're going to be talking about his new book, uh, which you can see behind him, Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, How Abraham Lincoln's Commitment to Science and Technology Helped Modernize America. If we were in an audience, uh, in a live audience, I would ask people to uh, welcome you, uh, but I'll keep that to myself. We're really delighted to have you, David, and um, your leadership as the president of the Lincoln Group of DC is where I first met you and uh, really um, immediately recognized <coughs> your your passion for the subject and also your acumen as a scholar. So it really is a, a treat to have you with us. Um, Very happy to be here. So uh, I'm always curious about the ways in which people come up with book ideas. Um, you already had two books about Lincoln and uh, with two very successful books about Lincoln under your belt, what drew you to this subject? What drew, what was so important about this that you wanted to spend another three or four <clears throat> years writing another book writing about Writing another book. Like yeah, the the uh, the earlier books were, you know, one was very uh, general uh, survey for general readers, and another one was very specific with some links to Nikola Tesla that I had uh, written another book about previously. Um, but this one really brought together kind of my two parallel lives. You know, I had uh, been very much interested in Lincoln from the beginning, from early on in my life. I was always into Lincoln. I got really into book collecting about books about Lincoln, and I've read hundreds of books about Lincoln. And, and so I was always interested in Lincoln. But, you know, I also... Uh, Grew up in a, a very uh, seaside town, you know, a seacoast town. And Jacques Cousteau was really big on TV when I was growing up. So the science side kind of won me over because I was interested in both. And I ended up getting my degrees in science and going on and working marine biology, like you said, and then working uh, throughout you know, 30 plus years in a scientific career. But all that time, I was still doing Lincoln on, on the side. And this book, really brings together those two things because I started to see over the years uh, for many 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 years longer than I was writing the book I started to see that there were a lot of science and technology uh, aspects of Lincoln's life and there were things about Lincoln where he under he knew he would mention things about science that it's like where did he get that I mean he grew up on a farm and the frontier and he didn't, he had hardly any formal education. Where did he learn the science? And uh, where did he learn the technology? And 
And then what did he do with it? So that's really what got me started down this road. And I started uh, putting two and two together. And I started finding that there was a lot more there than even I thought. So that was that was how this book came about. Yeah, I, it's just it's a it's a fascinating really foray into a story that many of us know a lot of. And as I said to you earlier, I, I was really struck by the rich storytelling and the way in which you uh, counterpoint that with your own deep knowledge of science. So it, it really it, it felt to me like a, a completely different read on Lincoln. Um, so thank you. It's, a, it's really successful, I think, in that sense. Um, can you discuss uh, how subsistence farming kind of laid the groundwork for Lincoln's scientific interest and and knowledge? Sure, you know, you know, everybody, I think, probably everybody on this call for sure knows that Lincoln grew up on subsistence farms in Kentucky and and Indiana and a little bit in Illinois. Um, out in the frontier, he wasn't even on a big farm someplace where there was a, a lot of other opportunities. And when you, when you look back and I say, well, how could he learn science? There's no science on a farm. Uh, well, I, I actually did some farm work when I was younger. My father grew up on a farm and there's a lot of science in, involved in, in farm work, especially on the frontier. Now he's not getting this from books and learning about these things and learning science. He's, it's coming down through his day-to-day, uh, -day, passed down from his father, things like obviously agronomy, you know, which is the science of, of crop culture. You know, what crops uh, to grow, how long they take, uh, what kind of soil they need, things like that. But also things like uh, uh, hydrology, which is how water moves and weather. And, you know, if it's gonna rain, which this happened in Kentucky and the Knob Creek farm, a little, little valley with the hills around it, rain very hard on the hills, but not in the fields. And it all rushed down the side of the hill into the fields and washed away all the seeds they just planted and all the topsoil. So you learn very quickly about how water moves and how important that is to farming. Uh, when, it, when they got the Indiana, they were in an unbroken forest. So you have to cut down all those trees. You can't grow crops in the middle of a forest. So you have to cut down a lot of trees. So there's a lot of different kinds of trees, dozens and dozens of species of trees, some with uh, different kinds of roots, which affect how they can be taken away, taken out. Um, there's hardwoods and softwoods that are some that, you know, you know that are good for making fence rails and others that are good for making uh, for log cabins so that you can build a log cabin so there's a little civil engineering you can build a log cabin that's not going to leak every time it rains and it's not going to flood every time there's water build up outside of it um, that, you know all sorts of things like knowing what crops uh, how long the crops take but also while you're waiting for them to grow you have to know, you have to forage for berries and nuts and things like that. So what things are, what can you eat that are be nutritious uh, that won't kill you? And there was a lot of diseases out on, on the, I mean, you know, his mother died of milk sickness, which was basically, and they didn't understand at the time, but they knew it had something to do with, with milk. And they eventually found out that it's from the cows. When the weather is really dry, they'll, wander around eating whatever they can find to eat and they would eat this white snake root plant which had toxins in it and the toxins would be passed through the the milk so there's all sorts of scientific aspects that come just from the the farming uh, just you learn on the fly from from farming and that stuck with him by the way um, we'll probably talk about it later but the the idea of farming and, and you know, he didn't like the labor, he didn't like the farming, but it stuck with him how important farming were and was, and that came, comes back later on in his life. Yeah, I, uh, since we are coming, live, coming to you live from President Lincoln's Cottage, uh, would you mind talking about that, that, that little interlude at President Lincoln's Cottage when he, he talks about his knowledge of trees? <laughs> sure. Yeah, he, um, he, he 
was so aware of different kinds of trees, um, uh, in part because of the growing up on a farm, but he also had to deal with with trees when he was building flatboats, you know, what kind of trees to use to flatboat so that the flatboat wouldn't leak and sink, um, and fence rails and all this sort of stuff. So he, uh, he, he would, you know, he told stories. So by the time he was president, um, he had a case where he was, um, people were talking about a tree, you know, some sort of evergreen tree. And, you know, that's a, a certain kind of tree. And he goes, no, 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 no. You're both wrong. It's neither like a pine tree or a yew tree. It's a kind of uh, emaciated um, uh, yew tree, I think is what, what he said it was. And, it's, you know, I know all about trees because I, I grew up with trees. So they became, it became pretty important uh, to Lincoln and he, uh, as he grew up. Yeah, I, I loved the the description that you provided of um, building the flatboat with Alan Gentry in, in 1828 and all of the knowledge that went into that. And I, I, I thought it was a very illustrative example. And since you brought it up, I, I wonder if you would kind of talk through that example of where his really practical knowledge about the natural world and the challenges that of working on the river kind of mm -hmm. came together. Sure. The the you know. Oh, by the way, I just I should say that this is not a science book. This is a book about Lincoln. So when I talk about science, it's written so that people could understand it. It's not something that my science colleagues would would uh, would be reading. It's something that uh, everybody should be reading. But the uh, when he did the flatboats, he, he took two flatboat trips. One from uh, Indiana when he was still there and the other from Illinois right after he got there to Illinois. Both went through uh, from Indiana went down the Ohio River to the Mississippi and down to New Orleans and from Illinois it went down the Sangamon River to the, the Mississippi River and down to uh, uh, New Orleans and in both those cases he had to build these flatboats. So he and, and Alan Gentry in, in, in Indiana and with others in Illinois, they had to figure out, well, what trees are we gonna use to build these flatboats? And, and they knew from, and he knew from, he kind of took charge of building these things because he had a lot of experience dealing with different kinds of, of trees. So, you know, you have to have something with tight, very tight uh, rings structure instead of very loose rings. So you have hardwoods versus softwoods. So he knew all of that. Well, going down the, the mist. So anyway, you build this flatboat, and you know it's it's a raft, but it also has higher sides. Not just a flat raft; it's got higher sides. It has um, really no keel, but you have to have use a leverage with these uh, um, long poles with paddles on the end to steer and to keep it away from the shallows. Uh, there was a, an enclosed area so that you could have uh, protect some of the goods that you're bringing down there, but also have a place, you know, if it rains, you can stay inside. Uh, and they would carry barrels of things like uh, whiskey was a big trading item and uh, corn and all sorts of crops, but also live animals like pigs uh, that they would bring down. But as they're moving down, you think, I think most people, when you think of a flat boat, you think of something like the Mississippi River, big wide river, you just get on this thing and you float it down. I mean, how hard can that be? It's actually quite difficult uh, because uh, I, I, I would recommend if people haven't read it, read Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi. Uh, he talks about all the problems you could have. Uh, the Mississippi River, uh, even though it's pretty wide, is very uh, windy, you know, it meanders back and forth all the time. And every time you hit one of these turns, you get a change in the way the current runs and you get a, a nice shallow area on both the inside and the outside of the curve. Um, and there are a lot of trees and sticks and things sticking up out of the mud and coming off from the shore that can get in the way and, and blockade the boat and even damage the boat. And if you're not paying attention 
the Mississippi River is was has been has had levees along it along it forever, uh, natural levees and then built up levees. And if one of those things break, they're basically holding the river in. So if one of those things breaks through, all the land around it is lowered. So if one of them breaks through, your flatboat could end um, out in some farmer's field on the other side of the river, you know, outside the river. And once you're there, you can't really move a flatboat. I mean, these things were pretty long, 60 feet big, long. So, so there were a lot of aspects um, that were scientific that, that had to do with physics, uh, leverage, uh, buoyancy, um, uh, just the way the currents worked, uh, the way uh, you had to steer things. So there's a, there's a lot of issues that related to that. And then of course you had to feed yourself. So there was a lot of foraging as well going down there. Uh, and there were a lot of dangers uh, along the way. And then at the end, of course, as, as difficult as it is to float a flatboat down river, you can't float anything up river. So once I got to New Orleans, the boat usually, the flatboat was usually broken up and either sold as a flatboat, but more often it was just broken up into its component parts, the wood slats that they would have to create to, to make these uh, floors and everything. They would break it up and sell that wood either for uh, construction of homes or for firewood or whatever, depending on, on what the need was. And then they would take steamships back up the river. And there he gained more scientific knowledge because steamships were, were still pretty new in, in the West where Lincoln was. And he worked those steamships. He, he cut cordwood, which was how they, they put in the boiler to, uh, to, in the furnace to boil the water to produce the steam. There were a lot of levers, you know, involved in turning that steam movement into moving the paddle wheels. Uh, and then he went up and sat with the, the pilots and the captains, learned how to be a riverboat pilot, which he did on the Sangamon River when he got back up to New Salem. Uh, so he was learning quite a lot during those experiences that uh, really informed him. The Mississippi, of course, becomes very important during the Civil War. And Lincoln used a lot of the knowledge that he had of the Mississippi from those two trips to inform his strategy making during the Civil War. Yeah, that's, that's I, as I said, I, I found that example really illustrative of the kinds of practical knowledge that he was gaining and that he was constantly seeking, um, which is just so powerful. I mean, you talked just now about him having become a, 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 a pilot on the river. Um, the book does a wonderful job of kind of moving through all of the trades that he engaged in. And I, I, I went away thinking that somehow surveying was the, the, the trade that really fit his character and his abilities the best. Um, and I wondered if you'd talk about that example a, a bit, because I, 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 both, both the political and the, and the technological parts of it are interesting, I think. Yeah, he, he, you know, once he got back up from the second riverboat, the, the second flatboat trip, um, he, he moved to New Salem and worked as a clerk in a store, eventually had his own store with a partner that didn't do too well. It winked out in his words and, and failed. And that was pretty common for stores in New Salem at the time. Uh, but he, uh, he was looking for work. He's looking at like, what do I do? I've been a on a farm my whole life. I've done these flatboat trips, but what are my skills? What can I do? So he tried things like, well, uh, every, every place needs, a, uh, needs carpenters. And his father was a carpenter. So he said, I'll do that. And he said, nah, I don't really like carpenters. Too much work. And then there was blacksmithing, which was even worse because not only is it too much work, it's very hot. So he didn't like that. He, he was an intellectual. He didn't want to do labor. So he wanted to use his mind. So he did, a, he did some time as a, as a clerk. He was postmaster for a while, uh, which involved a lot of calculation of things like postage, which there were no stamps or anything. You had to calculate it yourselves and the person receiving it paid the, paid the postage. Uh, 
But he really got, like you said, found his element with surveying. Um, surveying, you had this, this uh, uh, chain um, and a little viewfinder that you look through to, to set up the lines of areas for uh, people, property or for towns. He surveyed all of the, there's like six or seven towns that he surveyed, including one that they said, okay, what do we call our town? And they said, well, let's call it Lincoln after Lincoln. So it was the first town named after Lincoln while he was still alive before he was even famous, they named after him. But surveying uh, kind of took in his interest in, in mathematics uh, because um, you know, he, like you said, he, he learned to read, write, and cipher to the rule of three. That's all he got from his formal schooling. But he did a lot of study, of self-study in mathematics. And he learned a lot more math and science than he let on and other people uh, give him credit for. But one of the things he had to do with surveying was he had to learn uh, uh, the math behind surveying. So there's geometry which was something that he had to learn. So he studied Flint and a little bit of Gibson. They were the two big surveying books at the time. Um, and they also included a lot of trigonometry, which is the, the science of angles, things you know like sines and cosines and tangents and things that uh, a lot of people do in high school or college and then immediately forget. Um, you know, I, I, I wish I had forgotten it much sooner than I did, but uh, you know he learned all of that stuff on his own by reading books, so that he could be a surveyor. Uh, and the other aspect of that, and the postmaster that you alluded to, is critically important. <laughs> the surveying and the postmaster, they got him out into the countryside, and the legal career got him out into the countryside. And all of those things, when you're out there meeting everybody, people are spread out out there. It's not like you've got a town. You've got a lot of people spread out on farms. He met a lot of people and impressed a lot of people with his stories and his just his friendship and everything. And he got a lot of votes that way when he ran for, for state legislature originally and then later Congress and, and president. Um, and the surveying really fit that really well, as did the the uh, his legal career, his legal career, he did a lot of um, a lot of basic legal stuff early on, but then a lot of more complicated things uh, early, later. But he, uh, that got him out into the country where he could meet people. Yeah, I, I I was really intrigued by the way in which you make clear that his really his political ideology as a Whig and, and the desire for internal <clears throat> improvements grows from his own life experience and the experience of his family. Uh, and and that, that then is a kind of turning point. It's, it becomes, uh, one might say, a program <laughs> that, that carries him uh, forward in, into his presidency. And I, I think it would be interesting for folks to hear you talk some about that. Sure, you know, Lincoln, was a Whig before Whig was really a party, you know, in his his thinking. So when he first runs for state legislature in Illinois, he espouses what is really the Whig philosophy. Um, and it that it dovetailed very well with uh, his history of growing up on on the farm and being poor. You know, he he says when he's running for president that, you know, there, my early life, there's not much to say about it because, you know, I was, wasn't was much in it. Um, you know, it was basically from uh, um, uh, Gray's Elegy, the, uh, the simple annals of the poor. And that really affected him when he was thought, of, thought about politics and economy and how science and technology fit into all of that. Instead of just benefiting the economy, it's just benefiting the people born into wealth, who had resources, had uh, access to classical education, <clears throat> had, you know, in the South, they had hundreds of people forced to do all the labor for them. Lincoln came from a place where he didn't have any of that, it was very poor, had hardly any uh, education, 
and had to do all his own labor. So as he got into politics, he was very much into the Whig idea of government supported um, uh, internal improvement projects, which were what we would call like infrastructure. So back early on, it was things like uh, building roads. You know, roads were basically where your horse went and then it would turn the mud when, when, the, uh, when it rained and it would be impassable most of the year. Um, making rivers navigable, which was very important for him in New Salem because the Sangamon River, which was uh, very meander, meandered quite a bit, was very shallow and not very wide. If you could make that navigable, then New Salem would be able to get st even small steamships up past it and it would improve their economy. And so he pushed, and, you know, that was part of the Whig program that he pushed. He became the Whig leader in, in Illinois. Uh, also canals, uh, you could kind of cut through a lot of these meanders on some of these smaller rivers and just have a straight canal. And he knew that in New York State, the Erie Canal, which had gone into service around 1825, the Erie Canal had done great things for the development and the economy of New York. And the, the governor that, that was governor when that happened was, was DeWitt Clinton. And Lincoln wanted to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois and push a couple of canal projects, but especially the Illinois and Michigan Canal, which went from Chicago to the headwaters of the Illinois River, which connected to the Mississippi. Uh, that one did get built uh, and was, uh, was very important to the economy of Northern Illinois, especially the growth of Chicago. And then of course, there were other projects like uh, railroads. So that really got Lincoln interested in, in technology. And while all this was going on, there was a lot more um, development, technological development going on, like on the farm with uh, improvement in the way plows worked and, and reapers and things like that. And he was fascinated by all of that. And that all comes to play again when he's, when he's president. Yeah, I, I just want to stress that I, I think you've provided me with a with a new way of thinking about his evolution, right? The subsistence life and the poverty, the kind of exploration of the world, this this recognition that government has a role to play in mm -hmm. internal improvements, and and that really facilitates the right to rise, uh, and and creates a more equitable. A set of economic and social opportunities, and then that plays right into the into the the, the war effort, as you as you said. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 we're about to open up for for questions, but I guess I want to ask you two more two more questions. I think um, you've alluded several times to the way in which all of this. Uh, technology, this kind of interest in technology and this knowledge of science comes to bear on the on the war effort and, and his strategy in the war. And, and the book does a wonderful job of, of teasing that out over a, a couple chapters. I wonder if you could just give folks a sense of that since uh, obviously it's hard to talk about Lincoln without talking about the war. Right. And I, I think the, when it came to the war, he, was uh, very much, um, he very much remembered his time, like for example, on the Mississippi River. So early on in the war, uh, there was this anaconda plan that had come out. And the, the term anaconda plan was actually like the big snake, you know, was, was actually a derisive term by people who thought it was silly. Uh, and in practice, it, it was pretty silly early on because it required using ships to um, uh, to barricade the the coast uh, all the way down the uh, Atlantic coast around Florida into the Gulf Coast, and also to move ships and uh, new boats, river boats, down the Mississippi River and control that which would split the Confederacy into at least two pieces um, and would help 
control things. Now, early on, we didn't have a lot of ships. Uh, we didn't have a lot of people, uh, either in the Navy or the Army. So it wasn't really working early on. But eventually, it's exactly what happened. Uh, and Lincoln understood that if you could control the Mississippi River, you could control a lot of commerce and transportation so they wouldn't be able to get up the Mississippi River. So one of the earliest areas that was targeted was uh, the New Orleans uh, area to, to recapture that. Um, so that was one aspect. Uh, I mentioned that he, he pushed the idea of railroads when he was in Illinois. He worked as a lawyer, he worked for the railroads, the Illinois Central Railroad for a, a long time. It's the only, the only company that put him on a retainer for several years and he did quite a few cases for them. So he understood the importance of the railroads. So when it came to the war, he started, you know, he was very early on, uh, he got a wake up call at, at uh, the first battle of Manassas. Because if people know about the, the battle, it was the first battle and everybody thought the Union Army was winning on the first day, on, on early in the day. And then it turns out that uh, uh, Johnston's managed to get reinforcements up to, for the, Confederates, for the Confederate forces up there to Manassas using railroads. And the North had a significant advantage in railroad mileage and, and ability to build new locomotives. So Lincoln saw that and he was like, what are we doing? You know, we need to use this to our advantage. So he used technology like railroads and telegraph uh, to the advantage. In both cases, the North had much more capacity, many more miles of telegraph and railroad lines, um, much more consistency. So he was able to use those things and push them. Uh, I'll talk about, mention the telegraph real quick. The telegraph had, the first message on the telegraph had been 1844, not that long before the war, like 15 years or so. Civil War was the first time the telegraph was used as a communication device during wartime. Prior to that, you know, presidents would just say, okay, general, go off and win us the war. And they kind of hope they came back and they might be like take weeks or months to get information. The telegraph was essentially instant communication. Not by today's standards, obviously, it might still take days to get information. But so he could coordinate, he could get information from the front and he could coordinate generals in different places. And he did that very much, took the leadership role in coordinating his uh, his uh, his generals until he got uh, Grant, and then he knew Grant was on board, and Grant would do what he wanted what he wanted to do all along, and he just said, "Okay, go for it." Uh, by the way, there's an interesting story at the beginning of the war. Lincoln uh, took out books from the li Library of Congress, including uh, General Halleck's book on the art and science of military strategy. And he read these books and studied it because he had no military training. So he was reading these things, especially like the sciencey bits of it, the strategy parts of it. Um, and then after he made Grant, put Grant in charge, made him the general in chief, he returned the books to the libraries. I don't need these anymore, you know? So, so he, was, he was very much in that. Um, I saw one question and we can, we can talk about that specifically, but he definitely got in, involved with people um, with technology new ideas and technology dealt with scientific issues. And uh, a talk that I gave last night focused in on one of the chapters I have in the book called Institutionalizing Science, where he pushed and worked with Congress to push several uh, changes to the law to uh, create scientific infrastructure basically in the federal government, which had not existed. There was basically no federally supported science and technology going into the war, it was all private. So he created those things which took technological development that had been occurring and then you know, supercharged it. So the second half of the 1800s was uh, um, very, very rapid uh, growth in, in technology because of things that, that Lincoln had done.
Yeah, I was gonna I was going to point that out. I think that your the book does a ma wonderful job of making clear all of the ways in which he he does that both in, in the, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Agriculture, which are two very different manifestations of it. One is hyper practical and the other is very much about basic science, but uh, to, yeah. to have these kind of two different directions is just uh, remarkable. Yeah. And if I could expand just quickly on that, um, I think one of the things that really drove Lincoln was, especially with science technology, but education and everything else, because of how we grew up in poverty, on a farm, out in the frontier where there were very little uh, advantages, and he had to learn on his own. He understood that, you know, w the luck of birth really defined your life. You know, if you were born into wealth in a, on a plantation in, in, um, in Virginia, you know, Tom Jefferson, somebody like that, you know, you know, you had a lot of advantages and you could get access to education that somebody like Lincoln really couldn't. You had to self-teach himself. So he wanted to do things to improve or have the government facilitate um, people getting education, people getting access to education, education, people getting access to the benefits of science and technology. So something like the, the Department of Agriculture, you know, as a farmer, he hated farming uh, that that horrible labor all the time, every day, he just hated it. He couldn't wait to get away from the farm. But he understood that even by the time of the Civil War, the majority of Americans were still involved in farming. And he, and he had basically berated uh, farmers in Wisconsin in 1859 at the Wisconsin State Fair. And he said, listen, you can't just keep doing what you're doing. You need to bring science to agriculture. So Lincoln was the one who pushed Congress to create a Department of Agriculture, and their goal was to do science and to do re scientific research, um, and that, and then get that information back to farmers, to tradesmen, and to everybody else. That still exists. That Extension Service. I, in my prior career as a scientist, I did work with them a lot um, out in the fields. They're they're telling farmers like have this new way of uh, developing rice fields so that you can get a better yield. And, you know, he understood that it needed to go back down to everybody so that everybody could better their condition. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, and the fact that he was uh, building institutions is I think really significant. Um, we'll do a little blended uh, format here and take Fred's question because it's very relevant at this moment. Yeah. Uh, can you talk more about the Lincoln's role in the founding of the National Academy of Sciences? Sure. The, the National Academy of Sciences was created. Um, Lincoln signed it into law in March of 1863. Um, it had been something that was an idea. The National Academy was an idea that had been around prior to Lincoln's uh, becoming president. Um, the, the three main people pushing it, uh, prior to Lincoln was um, Joseph Henry, who was the first secretary of the Smithsonian, who had become an informal science advisor to Abraham Lincoln during a war. Lincoln counted on him for everything. It had something to do with science and technology. Um, Alexander Dallas, Dallas Beach, or Bach, depending on how you like to pronounce it, he was the head of the Coast Survey um, during the war. But he was one of the people who had been pushing this idea of the National Academy and some other things. And then the third person that was involved in this group was Louis Agassiz, who was a very highly respected scientist, uh, Swiss-born American scientist teaching at Harvard, uh, very influential. So the three of them really had pushed this idea in the previous administration and James Buchanan was said, I don't think so. You know, I don't wanna have anything to do with this. The South was very much against any kind of federal influence on science and technology. The South had disdained manufacturing and, and industrialization, uh, mainly because it would, they thought it would hurt the aristocratic uh, wealthy uh, plantation owner that that really dominates the economy in the South. 
and that it would eventually you know, hurt slavery. So they, they rejected that. But during the war, Louis Agassiz in particular said, you know what, this Lincoln guy, he's a science geek and he's a, into technology. I betcha he would like this idea. So I talk in more detail about the book, but very quickly, um, Agassiz approached a guy by the name of Senator Henry Wilson, who is from my home state of Massachusetts. Wilson was the one who introduced the bill in the Senate and coordinated with the House to get it uh, introduced there. Got them both passed the last minute of the session by voice vote, ran it up the street to have Lincoln sign it. But I dug out some information that shows that Lincoln didn't just sign the bill that somebody threw on his desk. You know, he, he had been working with Henry Wilson for the previous year on, um, on the DC Emancipation Bill. And he had met with uh, Wilson in this time period when they were discussing the bill. And then there was another person named uh, Admiral Davis who was uh, also heavy in, in assisting the government. He, um, he has a letter saying, suggesting that he had discussed this with Lincoln prior to its becoming a law. So I think he did have something to do with it. He had a lot more to do with the Department of Agriculture for sure, but uh, he had a little bit to do with creating the National Academy and he certainly was, he was all in on supporting this idea. In fact, the National Academy, one of the first things they did was try to figure out how to deal with compasses on ironclads. Uh, you know, a compass, all, all ships need a compass so they know where they're going. They work really, really well on a big wooden ship with sails, not so well when you surround it by iron. So they, they had to figure out how to deal with that. So that, they were very uh, important. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's, a, that's a, a rich answer and such a, such a great set of examples mm -hmm. about that, the process of institutionalization. We have a great question from uh, Dick W. D did Lincoln understand and support the technological developments in war making that came along during the war? The book does a very good job of, of laying out some of those things. Dick is asking specifically about rifle, rifling of bar gun barrels, more powerful explosions, the use of hot air balloons. Yeah, he, uh, and I see another question that looks like it's directly to me that talks about Lincoln and firearms and repeating rifles. So I'll, I'll blend these together. Um, Lincoln very much was interested in new weaponry um, and was very much pushing technological developments. He, uh, there was the Spencer repeating rifle, which the other question asked. He, um, he would get people lining up, you know, at the beginning of the war, everybody lined up and they want a job, you know, but once it became clear the war was gonna last a while, he, uh, you started getting more and more of these people were pushing their inventions. And they knew that Lincoln would listen to him, to them. So they would come in there with these new weapons that they had ideas for, or new scientific issues or new technological things that would end the war tomorrow. They were all, they were all, they all promised that would end the war tomorrow. Um, so Lincoln talked to a lot of these people and some of them he tested. Uh, Spencer said, hey, I have this rifle that you can put seven shells in a cartridge, put the cartridge into the, the, the butt of the, 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 the rifle stock, have a lever to move them into the, the chamber and you could fire seven shots very quickly. Uh, up to that point, in fact, through the war, most people were using muskets. And they eventually switched from smoothbore to, to rifled muskets, but mostly they were using muskets. And this was a great idea, and Lincoln loved it. He went out on what's now the ellipse, and he tested it, and he shot seven shots, and he was not a bad shot. Uh, but the war, the, the ordnance officer, Ripley, and others, they didn't like the idea of technology, all these newfangled things. Something is like a repeating rifle, get a lot more moving parts. Uh, you have to have new supply chains for all sorts of different weapons, all sorts of different types of, of munitions, bullets, all sorts of problems that could be created in the supply chain. And so the military people didn't like, uh, Lincoln did push them 
he pushed the Spencer, he pushed something called a coffee mill gun, which was a, a single barrel, but it was like a very rudimentary uh, machine gun. Uh, and then he pushed, there were improvements to that. And eventually at the end of the war, there was the Gatlin gun, which people have probably heard of, which didn't really get used much during the war, but he was pushing those sorts of things during the war and quite a bit of other things. Uh, things like hot air ballooning. Um, he was, you know, he pressed the military again. Uh, in the hot air balloons, there was a guy by the name of Thaddeus Lowe, who uh, was very smart. He wasn't the first guy to, to suggest balloons, but he was the first guy to be smart enough to get hooked up with Joseph Henry of the Smithsonian Institution, who, who obviously had Lincoln's ear. And um, he did another thing. He, he set up a balloon on what is now the mall uh, and it's all tethered to the, to the ground. But he had a, a, a telegraph line and he sent the telegraph from the balloon down to Lincoln in the White House saying, I have the pleasure of sending you the very first aerial telegraph message from a balloon. So Lincoln several times insisted to early on uh, Winfield Scott and, uh, and later to McClellan that let's talk to this guy low and he even walks low over to Scott's office and say, talk to this guy, we want balloons. Uh, and they did put balloons in the service. Uh, this is probably one of the few things that Lincoln and George McClellan agreed on. McClellan liked the ideas of balloons. So they were used for a while. Uh, unfortunately, not long enough during the war because uh, there was a disagreement over payment and they stopped. Uh, Lowe said, I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. Um, uh, I see in a the question, there were some things about illegal warfare. There was some questions that were very tricky for Lincoln. Um, there, were, there were several uh, suggestions that in, inventions that involve things, old technology, like something called Greek fire, and these incendiary devices that would basically put either a, a, a toxin or um, it would just cover them like when we think about napalm and the Vietnam War, he was like, no, we're not gonna do that. And in fact, he got a guy by the name of Lieber to write out um, basically rules of war to say there are limits to what we're going to do. And the Lieber uh, codes were the basis for what became the Geneva Convention later on for, you know, there are limits to how you treat people. Um, so, he, but Lincoln was very much involved in, in all of this. Um, there's, a, there's a great question here from Jeffrey about uh, Lincoln's knowledge of the origin of species by Darwin, uh, which you do talk about in the book uh, a good bit. Yeah, he, um, uh, Lincoln, as far as I know, and as far as everybody knows that I'm aware of, probably did not read The Origin of Species. The Origin of Species only came out late 1859 in England, and, and by the time it was here, Lincoln was well into um, running for president and, and being president. So he probably did not read Darwin, but he did read an earlier book um, called The Vestiges of Creation, which was had been written by a guy by the name of Robert Chambers uh, a dozen or so years before. And it, it had some ideas that, you know, Darwin basically disagreed with that weren't quite, weren't quite right. But he had the basic idea of, of what we later called evolution. So, and Lincoln um, agreed with that. Uh, uh, his law partner, William Herndon, writes in, in his book that Lincoln read Vestiges and he read it cover to cover. He read it very closely and he understood it and they would discuss it because uh, Herndon was a, a sciencey guy himself, had a lot of science books. Uh, they discussed it and Lincoln agreed on the general idea that there was some sort of uh, uh, genetic influence and, uh, and change in that, in that uh, data adaptation. So uh, while he didn't actually read uh, Origin of Species or, or anything by Darwin, 
he did see things that uh, that al alluded to what Darwin would later very much quantify, and and he and he believed in that general general idea. Uh, he didn't become an expert on that particular issue, but um, but I, I talk about that, and there was a lot of science and pseudoscience that was used both to defend slavery and claim that white people were superior to black people. And there was science and some pseudoscience that would use to say that, well, no, everybody is the same species and that everybody's the same. There's only one race, uh, there's no difference. And therefore there is no basis for this idea of slavery. So uh, science became, was very important. Um, I, I see in that question, I want to just mention about Asa Gray and Henry David Thoreau. Um, I just uh, came back, by the way, from uh, Concord, Massachusetts. And the Concord Museum has a great exhibit on Lincoln right now, Lincoln and the uh, Lincoln Memorial's 100, uh, 200, uh, 100th anniversary. I should know this since I emceed the program in May on the, on the anniversary, but <clears throat> on the 100th anniversary. But Concord was where Henry David Thoreau lived and a lot of other writers like Hawthorne and um, Louise May Alcott and Harriet Beecher Stowe, a lot of people that became very important to the war effort. Um, and he did read several of those. Uh, Emerson is, was also at that time. Um, so he, he was aware of some of those other, other writers who had been writing um, prior to the Civil War. I'm not sure about Thoreau specifically, but, the, but at least Emerson and, and Harriet Beecher Stowe and, and uh, Louise May Alcott. I, I'm, I find myself wondering, uh, I mean, you, you touched on it. One of my questions that we didn't get to earlier, you just alluded to, which, which is, uh, I mean, I think the book provides a really great description of the, of what the, of so-called scientific racism, the ways in which people were using scientific ideas to justify inequality. And I, I think it'd be useful to go into a little more depth about that, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, there were people, uh, it started really from a religious point of view. Um, and they, they like to say it was scientific, but it was a religious point of view. You had two different views of creation. You had a, a, a polygenic creation where um, the creator created um, white people and then separately created black people and brown people and yellow people and you know all these different races. He separately created them, put them in certain places and gave them a hierarchy. So that was the basis going into a lot of this. And then there was a monogenic viewpoint where everybody you know, was created, Adam and Eve. And that at some point there was split. And that split usually is with something called the curse of Ham, where Noah, after the flood, he's, he gets a little drunk and he, he's passed out in his, in his tent. And Ham walks in and sees him in his nakedness and the brothers cover him up and, and Noah's really angry at this. And he curses Ham's son, Canaan. And he says, you will be a servant to Ham's brothers for the rest of your life. And somewhere along the way, um, that was modified so that all of these people are now, you know, the, the Canaan side are all Africans. You know, the, and that's the rationale for them being a separate division. So the science kind of piled on this idea, this religious idea of, of separation. And they would say that uh, there were different, either different species of humans. And just to be clear, there's one species of human. There's no such thing as race. It's a social construct that we just decided we would have because of color, but there's no difference between people. But they would um, they would say that uh, there are different types of people, where there are different races or just types, and there are all sorts of people putting out these categories 
even uh, in, in science, there's a guy everybody's heard of called Linnaeus, who came up with what's called the, uh, uh, the binomial nomenclature. So you have two parts to any, any species name, the genus and the species, and like humans are homo sapiens. That's our gene, that's our species, homo sapiens. And everyone, every, every animal, organism, plant, animal, whatever, has that two parts. Lanius even added, he said, well, we'll put a third part on it, be like a variety. And he split up uh, Europeans from Americans, by which he meant uh, Native Americans, and Africans and uh, Asians. And, uh, oh, we had a really strange thing where it's like wolf people or some really fantastical thing that he later dropped. But all these things were used to try to promote the idea that, that Europeans were superior by nature, by science over African, Africans, people born in Africa, and, and then by extension, other places were, that weren't European. And <clears throat> there were some very influential people. I, I had mentioned uh, uh, Louis Agassiz before. Louis Agassiz was one of the most respected scientists in the United States, but he was very racist. And he, he, he couldn't stand the idea that anybody who was not European stock could possibly be equal to him. And he promoted the idea of this, uh, this difference. Um, there were also other, there were doctors who would promote the idea that, that being black was, a, was a, a disease and that you could be cured of it. And uh, people who did studies on skulls saying that all these, you know, you could tell from different skulls, you know, whether somebody was, you know, black or white or smart or, or not smart. I mean, it was all, you know, in retrospect, it was all hogwash, but it was, it was, that was being promoted to do that. So there was a lot of that going on during that time, um, a lot of pseudoscience to try to rationalize the idea that here we have a country based on all men are created equal, and yet we've enslaved four million people simply based on, you know, the color of their skin, which is nothing more than, you know, living near the equator for generations and generations, you know. So, uh, so I, do, I do talk about that in, in, in specifically and how much he, uh, how much Lincoln was uh, understood about that. I, I think you do a, a really uh, wonderful job of contrasting that context that you've described here so richly with <clears throat> really uh, straightforward political analysis around the situation, right? I mean, uh, you have to be careful about these things because, um, you know, if, 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 if you make color the determining factor, then uh, anybody who's lighter skinned than you can <clears throat> enslave you. Uh, the same with intelligence. I mean, you, you've got a, a, a lovely um, quote in there from Lincoln. Yeah. He has a, that's, he studied Euclid geometry when he was a, a congressman. Um, he realized that it was pretty common for Eastern elites with classical education to study Euclid geometry, not for the math part of it, but for the logic part of it. And so Lincoln started studying it and he, um, it dovetailed with his natural logical abilities and his natural mathematical abilities that he had already built. So um, he, yeah, I, I really like that passage too, because he said, well, you know, you say, well, it's just because you're, you're lighter skin than they are. And it says, well, be careful, because if somebody comes around that's lighter skin than you, like somebody from Sweden or something, you know, comes over and is lighter skin than you, then by your rationale, he could enslave you. So he uses this this uh, Euclid, Euclidean logic to dispel um, what what people were suggesting to, to to get people to challenge their own their own views. So um, we're going to need to wrap up here. Uh, this has been a really interesting conversation for me, and and I'll just say again, I encourage everyone to read this book. It it opened a, a vista on Lincoln's life that 
uh, I had neither anticipated nor contemplated. <laughs> it's really, it's it's really richly uh, elaborated, and and thank you, David. Um, yep. I had the good fortune of having dinner with a donor from President Lincoln's cottage in December. And he, uh, in the course of our conversation, asked me a wonderful question, which I'm going to ask you. Just imagine that you're having din dinner with Abraham Lincoln. What do you it, ask him? Well, it depends on if I'm having dinner in his time period or my time period. Um, I would say in my time period, I would say, how do you smarten up these people? <laughs> you know, I know, you know, he, he had to deal with a lot of different, uh, different views. And there was a lot of, obviously, there was a lot of racism and there was a lot of different views. Uh, even, even abolitionists were mostly still racist, didn't like the idea of equality for the racists. They didn't think slavery was, was something that should stay around, but they also didn't agree think that people should be have uh, that everybody should actually have equality um so i would i guess i in his time period i would ask him like how did you you know how did you read people so that you could understand their motivations and be able to try to convince people um to move towards a position that was more tenable and and i think that's probably I'd probably ask the same thing for, for today because we have the same sorts of, of problems. You, know, you have people who say, at least, they firmly believe in things that are just, you know, how, how, how can you still believe that? I mean, this is 2023. Um, and then how do you convince a lot, all these people with different viewpoints? Uh, and especially right now, we have a case where you basically have people with views at, at extremes and not a whole lot of people talking in the middle. And I'd like to be able to figure out ways to talk to people in the middle and, and find solutions to, to things, not just uh, yell at each other. So uh, I think Lincoln would be a good resource for, for that. And, and your book, I think, does a wonderful job of bringing together Lincoln's very uh, natural and extensive humanity uh, with his scientific interests and 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 kind of that those uh, does a wonderful job of bridging those uh, supposed differences. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank you again for joining us tonight and uh, for this really interesting conversation. Um, thanks again to all of you who've joined us. Uh, we're particularly grateful to our members and supporters and our volunteer leaders from the board. Uh, Hannah has put in a number of places in the chat where you can connect to our uh, bookstore and, and our museum shop and, and acquire David's book, which is also available elsewhere. But um, thank you, David. Uh, thank you for an interesting conversation. And thank you for continuing to deepen our understanding of this remarkable man. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. <laughs>